OMG, as the kids say these days. I'm Tom, welcome to another tour. I'm gonna lower my mask, relax. We're not gonna be around people, it's okay. It's just so you can understand me. I'm gonna put it back on if I talk to anyone, so chill out. You can see behind me, you got Canal Street. You also have the Holland Tunnel. Today we're doing a tour of Tribeca. Me and Phil are gonna walk around here, but before we start, please subscribe. Please just go ahead and like the video because you're probably gonna like it anyway, so just click the little like thing. I don't know what to tell you other than uh, this should be a good one. A lot of cool stuff here, so uh, uh, let's go. So we're walking through Tribeca, which stands for Triangle Below Canal. Tribeca, oh my God. This is a very fancy neighborhood today. Didn't always used to be. But I'm gonna to talk to you about all that stuff. A lot of celebrities in this neighborhood, a lot of very rich people. It's one of the most expensive neighborhoods in New York. We're gonna walk through it. So let's walk around. You can see some of the cobblestone streets. This date, these date back to back when this was a uh, area for the hoity-toity of New York. Come on over here, Phil. You're on this side. <laughs> we have over here to the left, this building here on Hudson Street. This is where Jay-Z lives. Jay-Z lives in this building, you ever heard of him? He's a little, uh, he's a rapper. I don't know, some of you international people may not have heard of him. He's dating Beyonce, maybe you've heard of her. Or he's married to her, sorry. But this is where they got married. That's how, uh, that's how uh, much they love their apartment here in Tribeca, up on the roof. He owns a penthouse here. Uh, Jay-Z, by the way, got his name from the J and the Z subway line that ran near his apartment in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, where he's from. What? He actually uh, used to sell drugs and he used to uh, rap under there. It was a very important line for him. You're welcome for that fact. You guys are never gonna forget that in your entire lives. You guys are gonna be talking to your friends one day. I don't know where you are, maybe you're in Madrid or Argentina and your friends are gonna mention Jay-Z and you're gonna be like, hey, you know where he got his name? And you're gonna say that fact and you're gonna remember this face. You're welcome. Here to my left, you also have 443 Greenwich Street. I'm gonna get into the history here in a second, so chill out. Okay, we're getting started. But this is supposedly the paparazzi-proof building of Tribeca where they have an underground garage, underground entrances, a private courtyard, so uh, it gives privacy to people. So celebs like that. So you have people like Justin Timberlake, uh, Jessica Biel. You have uh, Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds. You've got uh, Harry Styles, OMG. Uh, the you also have Meg Ryan. She's like the Harry Styles of 1980s female actresses. Very nice little building. You can still see the cobblestone streets back when this was a this was a residential part of Tribeca. Now Tribeca hasn't always been one big neighborhood like it is today. It has actually patchwork of different neighborhoods. Uh, and we're walking through what used to be kind of like the suburb part of it, like a upper middle class housing uh, here near to kind of what is today Canal Street and what used to be St. John's Park which we'll talk about. Um, there was also a part where the Washington Market was further south near what is today the World Trade Center. Further east uh, there was actually more the uh, clothing and all that stuff closer to Broadway and then on the complete west were the piers. But you can still see the industrial buildings here as well. Warehouse it says up there on the, on the, on the side of the building. A lot of these buildings have been repurposed into condos and apartments, very expensive ones. Now this is one of the most expensive neighborhoods in New York City. The median income, I read an article from 2018, was $900,000. Around $900,000 is the median income, a yearly income. If any of you guys out there make $900,000, uh, I'm gonna put my PayPal and Venmo in the uh, description, so. Also, too, I've got Patreon coming here very soon. But uh, yeah, and also, too, uh, se the sales, the apartments here, not to, nothing's going to be less than a couple million at least. Everything's very, very expensive. Take a left here. But like I said, it hasn't always been this way. Tribeca is often compared to Soho because both of them are extremely expensive neighborhoods, but also because they kind of came about around the same time. And a lot of these industrial spaces, they used to be lofts. You can get on this side, Phil. Look at this, seamless. These industrial spaces have been refitted to be lofts. So if you watch a movie and you see the characters come out of the elevator into their apartment, that's what you see here. You see them doing a shoot over here, it looks like. 
This building here is actually the old, so this, these two guys with the last names Wells and Fargo, you guys may have heard of them. They started obviously Wells Fargo, but they also started a company known as American Express. American Express used to be a delivery service. They used to use horses. This was one of their stables. See, they're doing a photo shoot over there. I guess maybe I should go over there and like, jump in the photo shoot. But this up here, you can even see they have the little bulldog on there, but these used to be the stables of the actual horses that they used for the American Express delivery service. I wonder if that guy's famous, probably. And then over here to the right, you got uh, another building with a, this is actually home to John Stewart, the uh, host of The Daily Show for many years. He sold his apartment recently for like two, year, like two years ago, $20 million. The Daily Show. I should be a correspondent on The Daily Show. Maybe I should uh, give him my headshot and resume. All right. Thanks, Phil. I'll give him a call. You can talk to him. So now we're coming up here on the right to what used to be St. John's Park. We'll cross here. And over here to the left is what used to be St. John's Park. Now, this land, Tribeca was owned mostly by two different giant landowners starting in like the 1600s, 1700s. And those were Janssen, Roloff Janssen, and Anthony Rutgers. Janssen owned the area we're walking through here now. Rutgers owned the area a little further east. These are two different plots of land. They had their own different streets mapped out, et cetera, which is what creates a lot of the triangles and the smashing of streets in this area because they had their own little grids set up. Now Janssen's widow took over the land, started farming it, it passed down but then it was eventually sold over to, or given over to Trinity Church, um, which was a huge landowner back then. In 1705, it was given to them. And here, they eventually gave it up for uh, basically middle-class housing. There was a, a big little, a big park here in the middle uh, and all the, you know, hoity-toity of the neighborhood and, uh, and people who wanted to move out of the city went and lived up here. It was a, kind of like a suburb, the same way Soho was. Uh, you, you can hear about that in my Soho video. <laughs> Sick plug. Let's cross. It's called St. John's Park because there was actually a chapel of Trinity put up here uh, called St. John's. Go figure. In fact, a lot of the streets in um, Tribeca are named after well-to-do parishioners of Trinity, like Reed, Dwayne, Moore. These are some good facts I'm giving you guys. So today, this is kind of a roundabout for the Holland Tunnel, which we, we talked about earlier. So in 1851, this freight line goes up the Hudson River and it becomes very important because remember in 1825, the Erie Canal opened, right? Which brought tons of traffic, boat traffic down the Hudson River all the way from the Great Lakes. And Tribeca is right here on the west side. So it became a very important terminal for all of this. Now in 1866, this land was sold to Cornelius Vanderbilt who built the St. John's Terminal, changing this area because by then a lot of industry had come in already so the rich and the people who lived in these little houses, which you'll see an example of a little later, didn't want to be here anymore anyway. So by then, it just sprouted up tons and tons of industry around it. I told you guys about it, like the American Express, etc. All those types of people set up shop here. We'll be going into some shadow here, so we're going to watch Phil's magic fingers at work. How are we looking, Phil? Good. All right. So now we're walking uh, east. We're walking east further into Tribeca. Now remember, Tribeca started out as like a little suburb here at this area. Further south it was not. It was more of a, more of a market and stuff, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, it just like Soho, mapped kind of the same uh, development as Soho in the mid-1800s. As industry and manufacturing was booming in New York, so was this neighborhood. And you can still see all the buildings here with their aluminum awnings and their giant sloped entrances and the lofts. That's all from this time. Like I said too now, Tribeca is an extremely expensive neighborhood, but it has not always been so. Uh, in fact, it took off a little less, uh, a little later than Soho, for example. Soho became kind of the it neighborhood before Tribeca did. But it's got a lot of really cool history in this neighborhood, a lot of different types of history as well, because so many different um, neighborhoods existed within this neighborhood. The name Tribeca wasn't even used until way later on, like the night, late 1970s. In fact, there were other things that they called it. Uh, one of the things they were trying to call it was Soso, south of Soho. I didn't know if you knew that. It's kind of funny. You have a police station near the first precinct. Now we're going to cross Varick, which by the way, used to be 7th Ave. So what happened was Varick 
was a street up and then becomes Seventh Ave further up. But they had to create that. So Seventh Ave didn't start until Eleventh Street because the grid of Manhattan, when it was implemented in 1811, had Greenwich Village as kind of an exception because they had already mapped out their streets there. So it didn't start till Eleventh Street. So in the early 1900s, they had to extend Seventh Avenue down to Canal Street. Uh, down to this way, basically connecting it to Varick here. And to do that, they had to widen Varick because they had the subway going under it as well. So they widened Varick, and uh, it was a big deal. I'll tell you about that here a little later as well. Now you see this building in front of me. This building here is the AT&T Long Distance Building. This building is a beautiful Art Deco building. Ah, oh, you guys know Art Deco? We've talked about that in other, um, in other videos. Art Deco got its name from L'Exposition de Art Decoratif. Thank you very much. Je parle français et anglais. Anyways, I don't. I don't that's, only, that's the only thing I know how to say in French. But this was actually uh, from 1932, home to uh, iHeartMedia, home to um, the Tribeca Film Institute, which was started by Robert De Niro. We'll talk about that a little more as well. Or maybe I should go leave my headshot and resume there, <laughs> you know? You see they're shooting something here. It's pretty cool. I wonder what they're shooting. We have over here the American Thread Building. You guys probably don't give a crap about the American Thread Building when they're shooting a TV show. I'll find out what they're shooting, maybe. But the American Thread Building is kind of a cool story. We'll keep walking. The American Thread Building was built in the late 1800s for a wool exchange, but uh, it kind of failed. So it became bought by American Thread in the early 1900s. Pretty cool uh, building, pretty cool building design. But a cool story about that building is that in the 1980s, they had an art exhibition in one of the lofts in there. And Keith Haring created a, a piece on the, on the brick in the actual loft. And it stayed. You know, they got rid of all the other art that was in there. Obviously, people sold it, whatever, those pieces hanging up. But that, that piece that he made into the brick stayed. And it was rediscovered in 2007 when a banker was trying to renovate a loft in there. And they found this piece with Keith Haring, who died in like the early 90s. And they had people basically um, appraise it. And they said, if you could remove it, which you cannot, if you were able to remove it from the brick, it would be worth like a million dollars. So it's just sitting in there in the apartment. It's kind of cool. So if you buy that apartment, you got a, you know, Keith Haring in your own apartment. It's pretty cool. Also, too, here to the left, you have a hotel known as the Roxy. The Roxy Hotel. Uh-oh, we're going into light, Phil. Come on. You got this? Phil, Phil, Phil. We got to come up with a theme song for you when you do this, these lighting changes. This is the Roxy. It's named after a man named Samuel Rothfeld. His nickname was Roxy. He was actually the first, like, head of Radio City Music Hall, was a super famous entertainer and host on the radio, etc. And that's where Roxy got its name. It was actually, this got its name from a theater that was opened by Rothfell, uh, who started out, you know, doing all that stuff and at Radio City Music Hall. By the way, the Rockettes got their name from Roxy. They used to be called the Roxyettes, but then they changed it to Rockettes because it was too, it was too much of a mouthful. You're learning stuff, Phil. I saw your head nod. What a concept. All right, let's take a left here, or a right here. So that was Sixth Avenue here, Sixth Avenue, which goes up to Greenwich Village. So now we're gonna come, on a uh, come up to a little house known as the Gideon Tucker House. You're gonna get a good look at uh, what the little tiny houses used to look like. Uh, also too, check this out, this is kinda cool. As we walk by the cast iron buildings here, there's a lot of cast iron here. I talked about the cast iron buildings in the Soho video. Already plugged that, don't need a sick plug that anymore. But uh, you can see there like little imprints of where it came from. Hey guy. <laughs> hey. Hey. That's okay. Hey. <laughs> Have a good one. I love dogs. Can't, I'm not going to lie to you. This is it. This is the Gideon Tucker house, and it was built in 1809 by, for a guy named Gideon Tucker, uh, who was actually a former commissioner of education uh, in New York City, and he lived here. As you could tell, that the, this is what the houses used to look like back when they were cobblestone back in the day and people would ride their little carriages and tip their hats at each other and say, oh, how are you doing, Mr. Tucker? Oh, I'm doing fine today. How are you? Great. And they were probably racist too back then too. Does that mean? Yeah. Accurate, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. This is super cool. This is my favorite thing in the, in the, in the uh, neighborhood. So let's keep on moving, Phil. And you're gonna get, we're gonna get a shot inside too. This here is the hook and ladder number eight. This is the Ghostbusters Firehouse. So this was built in 1903, a beautiful Beaux-Arts building. You're gonna come over here, Phil. A beautiful Beaux-Arts building. This was built in 1903. 
Um, but it was used as the firehouse for Ghostbusters, the 1984 film written by uh, Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis. If you've never seen that movie, jump off the George Washington Bridge. No, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But watch it, it's very good. It's a great New York movie. But this was the exterior for the firehouse. Kind of a cool story. The interiors were shot in LA, but the exteriors were here. And when they were shooting here, Dan Aykroyd, by the way, his dad was a professor of the paranormal. His grandfather wrote a book on ghosts. Like he was always obsessed with the paranormal and the supernatural and ghosts. So he was a huge fan of Isaac Asimov growing up. And when they were shooting here, they created this huge like traffic jam in the area because they always had people out and people were so interested. And one day there was a traffic jam and one of the people who got caught in the traffic jam was Isaac Asimov. What? So he gets out of his car, angry as all hell. He walks down to this chute and says, who's in charge here? They point to Dan Aykroyd. He goes up to Dan Aykroyd and he starts yelling at him in his face to you know, tell him off. So he got told off by his idol, kind of cool. But a pretty cool building, it's still an active firehouse. It actually used to be two garages and they had to cut it in half when Barrick was widened. Remember I said that? Also up here you have a window, you don't have to pan up there, I'll, I'll get B-rolled, Phil. That's a little lingo for you guys. But that used to be JFK Jr.'s apartment uh, up next to that water tower. Uh, he was one of the first celebrities to move into this neighborhood and make it cool and interesting. Uh, also on this block is a lot of fame Billy Crystal, Carol Alt, Jay Moore, all people who live on this block. Kind of crazy. Jay Moore, yeah, it's a big name right there. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie, um, uh, what's the biggest movie he's been in? Uh, Jerry Maguire. He was, he was Tom, uh, Tom Cruise's nemesis in Jerry Maguire. I was, just, I was just watching a video of Tom Cruise, just like a random YouTube video, how they, how they like, hopefully you guys are getting this recommended to you randomly. But it was a random video recommended of, of Tom Cruise and I watched it. And it was him like coming out of a hotel in New York and all these people like saying, you know, hi, whatever. And I was watching and this woman who was filming it was like, Tom, I just want a handshake. Tom, I just want a handshake. And she goes, you had me at hello. You had me at hello. And I just remember thinking like, who does that? Who goes up to like a famous person and quotes the movie at their face? What does she expect he's gonna do? Like be like, you, you know that line, thank you. Anyway, sorry, I don't know why I just ranted about that. But you can see all these aluminum awnings. These are all here because they used to hang stuff from them. These were industrial buildings. Now they are all uh, not. These are all trucks that are, you know, holding all the equipment and stuff for the shoot that we just saw. Important to keep in mind, shooting on location in New York is extremely expensive. Because you gotta get permits to do all this. You gotta get permits to park all these things. They basically move parking for you and police enforce it. And then you gotta, you know, have all these trucks set up and, and you know, you're, you're plugged into electric, electric lines, all kinds of crazy things. So it's very expensive. We're talking like $100,000 a day to do this. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> here to the left, you got, you got Bubby's. This Bubby's here, this restaurant, was opened in 1990. Uh, it's been here for a bit, but it's a huge like celeb watching spot in the, in the neighborhood, really good pancakes. Also too, where Adrian Grenier worked when he was uh, in Devil Wears Prada, in this movie, Devil Wears Prada. This was where his character worked. Yeah, he's kind of my doppelganger. Right, Phil, do I look like Adrian Grenier? Oh, totally. Thanks. No, Adrian Grenier looks like you. Thank you, thank you. That's why I pay you the big bucks, Phil. But you can see there's people outside in the, you know, having coffees and stuff. It's kind of nice, they set up all these little outside places to eat and drink. And here down, you can see further downtown, you can see uh, the World Trade Center. We're very close to the World Trade Center. In fact, after 9-11, this neighborhood was one of the most damaged neighborhoods uh, in all of New York by 9-11. Uh, because of its proximity. Here you could see these signs up on the cones and stuff. These are the, these are, this is what they're shooting. They put these up whenever they're shooting something, uh, filming something. This is to tell people they can't park here and stuff. They're shooting Art World, it's called Art World. And it's possible that that's a code name for something. A lot of times they'll use code names for things so that people don't know what they're shooting. It's crazy, that the things they have to go to because if they put the real thing for some of these movies, everyone would show up and watch it and ruin it. Like the Marvel movies, whenever they're shooting those, they can't use a real thing because all the, all the dorks will come out, all the, sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Feels like, I like Marvel. But no, people will come out and they'll start, they'll ruin it if they know about it. So they have to take all these measures. Like for example, when they shot Sex in the City, 
they shot the ending of it at the New York Public Library, which I talked about actually in a video. Uh, sick plug, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyways, when they shot that, they actually had to shoot multiple endings to avoid uh, people watching it who were watching outside to know what happened. Uh, so they shot endings that they weren't even going to use. Kind of interesting. So, what the heck was I talking about? I forgot now, Phil. Uh, you were talking about uh, Devil Versada, uh, another sick plug. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> no, I was talking about 9-11. Um, after, so after 9-11... Yeah, that's a great transition, transitioning into 9-11, a real pick-me-up. But no, what I was going to say was that after 9-11, one of the residents of this neighborhood committed himself to improving the neighborhood and picking it up, and that was Robert De Niro. And what he did was he started the Tribeca Film Festival, which many of you may know, it's one of the most famous film festivals in the world. So the following year, he had the Tribeca Film Festival, and in 2002, they actually started the film festival by premiering um, Star Wars 2, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. It's a big deal to premiere something like that at your festival. It made it just shoot up in the, you know, importance. Bet you didn't know that, Phil. You're like, yeah, I know, I'm not a dork tour guide. <laughs> All right. So also, too, here to the left, you have West Broadway. West Broadway was renamed because it used to be Chapel Street. And down on Thomas Street, it, a brothel district had sprouted up. In case you don't know what brothel is, uh, hookers, prostitutes. Sorry to be crude, but that's what happened. And uh, to distance itself from the church, because it was named Chapel after the church, after Trinity Church, they named it West Broadway. Over here to the left, you have New York Law School. Yeah, I went to law school. That's uh, a little bit of a sore point. Thought I'd mention that. Look at me now, Emery. Making YouTube videos, dear God. All right. But over behind it, you have the Jenga building, 56 Leonard. Interesting story was that New York Law School was running into financial trouble, so they sold that land and the air rights to build that giant high rise. But there were restrictions on building that high, but the city gave New York Law School a pass because they were in such trouble and it saved the school. Tell you what, I don't miss, I don't miss going to law school. I'll tell you that. I actually made a video about not going to law school. You should check that out. Sick plug. Over here you have the Western Union building. Another Art Deco building. Still home to lots of like, actually home to lots of communications and internet. Western Union left though, left in the 70s. And you can see we're really close to lower Manhattan. Here to the left you have the Odeon. It used to be a cafeteria. Then in 1980, by the way guys, you know Phil started his own YouTube channel. You guys should check, you guys should check it out. Sick plug, Phil. But over here is the Odeon. And this used to be a cafeteria, but in 1980, a guy named Keith McNally took it over and made it into like this bar and hangout. And if you've ever heard of like the 80s in New York and all the like high flying and all the craziness, that's Odeon. People like John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd. Um, who else? Like uh, Diane von Furstenberg, uh, Janice Dickinson. She used to say uh, no one at the Odeon uh, what was it? Uh, no one at the Odeon came for the food because no one there had an appetite. Wink, wink. She's talking about cocaine. They were doing cocaine, people. If there are any kids watching, I'm talking about Coke. Coca-Cola Classic. The good stuff. And actually, at a New Year's Eve celebration, uh, Philippe Petit crossed a tightrope while juggling fire. That's the kind of craziness you'd see there. Andy Warhol used to hang out there, Basquiat. The big 80s heavy hitters in New York. I'm gonna tell you right here. So this place, I don't really hang out in Tribeca a ton because it's so expensive here. Me and Phil just got bottled waters before this tour for 350 each. Cause Phil got thirsty. But I was also out here one time, I was walking by here and there was a woman eating here and she jumped up and like screamed and got angry. She's like, what the? Ah! And then uh, the waiter comes over like, oh, is everything okay? And she started berating him because there was a bee in the air. There was a bee. It wasn't his fault. Poor waiter. <laughs> a little level of entitlement you get when you make $900,000 a year, I guess. At least. Here's Dwayne Park. This is a pretty cool place. So James Dwayne was the first mayor 
of New York City after the Revolutionary War, and this is a park named after him. This land was given over in the late 1700s to become Duane Park. We'll walk through it. Not a huge park, you know, pretty, pretty quick walk. And you can see all the industrial buildings still up here with all the awnings. Over here to the left, you can see a laughing man. Uh, coffee is actually started by Hugh Jackman. You know Hugh Jackman, Phil? The Australian. Big fan of coffee. The Australians are big fans of coffee. So Hugh, uh, Hugh, Hugh Jackman, another one of my doppelgangers. Little known fact, the character Wolverine was created based on what Hugh Jackman becomes when he doesn't get his coffee. Great show. Thank you. So now we're walking over to Washington Market Park. This is a very important park because it commemorates a very important time in Tribeca's history. This used to all be Washington Market. Washington Market dates back to 1812. Uh, and it started out as a market, people meeting to sell their goods, etc. But it continued and continued to grow until by the end of the 1800s, there were 500 different vendors here, almost 4,000 farmers' carts here. It's a huge thing. Different buildings sprouted up around this area to cater to this market. It was a huge, huge deal down here in the southern part of Tribeca. Now, in the 1960s, early 1960s, it left to go to the Bronx. And then it was demolished for the World Trade Center because they were developing the original World Trade Center. So today, it's a little park. Washington Market Park. So the World Trade Center gets developed. All this land is, uh, is further south is all kind of demolished for, for the Trade Center. But this is another part of Tribeca. Remember, I told you there are different parts of Tribeca. We walked through St. John's Park. This was Washington Market. You had the piers. And then further east, which we'll head to, was more the, um, you know, the clothing and, and those types of dry goods. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the tour. But you see all the kids playing, everything, a lot of young families here. Uh, with money, obviously. You always see all the black cars waiting outside this park, waiting to pick up their kids, or the kids. And on the other side, you have BMCC. That's uh, Borough, of, Borough of Manhattan Community College. 20, 27,000 students. It's part of the CUNY system, the City of New York, uh, the university system. Anyways, uh, famous students there include Gabby Sidibe from Precious, Ooh. Queen Latifah, ah. And Cardi B, Cardi B uh, took classes there. In fact, she worked at a deli in Tribeca uh, when she was fired and became a stripper. Ah, oh, look at that. Hopefully one day people talk about tour guiding and me like that. They're gonna say, you know, Tom used to be a tour guide before he got fired and became a stripper. I never stopped. So Stuyvesant High School is down this way. You cross West Street over there. That's a very famous high school in New York. Home to four Nobel laureates, actually. Um, also was a, a famous alumni include uh, Tim Robbins, Lucy Liu, Paul Reiser, uh, Thelonious Monk went to school there, James Cagney, uh, Eric Holder, Attorney General. Oh, wow. It's kind of cool. All right, let's cross here. So I'm going to be talking about stuff on this side here, Phil, so just prepping you. We're a team. Yeah, no problem. So now we're walking on Chambers. Chambers is a street that runs to the north of City Hall. You'll see it here very soon. But this is, we're kind of starting to get to the southern port, uh, point of Tribeca. Down at the end of the street, you could see the municipal building. The municipal building, we've also talked about in other videos. We talked about it in the Brooklyn Bridge video. Sick plug, baby. Great, it's a great building though. Beaux-Arts, another Beaux-Arts building. Uh, I mentioned this as well, Beaux-Arts was very popular in New York around the turn of the 20th century because New York had arrived, tons of immigrants coming in, it had consolidated, so it became huge, second biggest city in the world behind London. So this style of architecture, which is big in Europe, New York was like, give us some of that Beaux-Arts stuff, baby, we want it. So they built buildings in Beaux-Arts all over the city, like the Municipal Building, Grand Central Terminal, the New York Public Library. Pretty cool. Over here to the left, too, you have this building, this red building on the corner. That building was the Frederick, uh, originally the Girard House, then became the Frederick Hotel. It, was, it dates back to the 1840s. You know, different prospectors and gold prospectors would stay there when they came back out east before going back to Europe or something. They would store their gold there. Tribeca is a big mix of architectural styles for the same reason that it's a big mix of businesses or was a big mix of businesses. Remember, the name Tribeca didn't come along till later, till the late 70s. In fact, once Soho started to become fancy, in 1973, Soho was uh, landmarked and it became a thing. 
And the artists who were in Soho were like, screw this, we're leaving. The, the, at least the starving artists. And they started slowly coming down to Tribeca. So by the 80s, Tribeca was like the place where all the cool kids hung out. Here to the left, you have a good example of this cast iron that Soho is famous for. This is the Cary Building from 1857. Really cool example of cast iron. But the cast iron just means that the facade, all of it, is manufactured in uh, making it made in cast. They make it in a cast and then they just throw it up. So it makes it much quicker. Even with all the detail that building has, it's made very quickly. So it's cheaper, less labor. So you'll see here on top of the municipal building as well is a statue of a woman named uh, Civic Fame. It's, a, it's Fame holding a crown of five points to symbolize the five boroughs of New York. Because it was made to, it was, the building was made to house the offices of New York after it consolidated as the five boroughs of New York. In 1898, the woman who's, who was the model for it is named Audrey Munson. Audrey Munson was one of the most famous people in the world in the early 1900s because she was used for statues all over New York. And people from all over the world passed in New York. She was discovered while walking down the street. And you got to keep in mind, this is before Instagram. This is before the internet. That being said, follow me on Instagram, <laughs> you know. But she became famous that way. And when she started to get too old and people started to move on to other people, she, she went crazy. It also didn't help that her landlord murdered his wife uh, to be with her. That didn't help. So she would actually leave the insane asylum and run around New York saying, that's me up there, that's me up there. She's got a bunch of statues in New York. Here to the left is another cool building. This is the Broadway Chambers building. It's the corner of Broadway and Chambers. And it's a great example of another Beaux-Arts building. A beautiful Beaux-Arts building, but more importantly, it is Cass Gilbert's first building. Cass Gilbert's a very famous New York architect. He designed the Alexander Hamilton Customs House. He designed the Warworth, he designed the Warworth Building. He designed um, the courthouse, the uh, federal courthouse in Foley Square. Big deal. And then across the street from it is the old A.T. Stewart Marble Palace. This building was built in 1836 as a department store. Now, this was before department stores existed. What this guy did is he revolutionized shopping. Before the Marble Palace, which is this building here, you had to basically custom order your stuff. So this guy came up with the idea of fixed prices. He came up with the idea of like mass selection. So you just pick up a large and order a large or just buy a large, I mean. He also did special sales to entice women specifically to shop there. And he did fashion shows to show off the clothes and get people wanting to, to buy clothes. So now we are at Broadway and Chambers and we're kind of at the end of Tribeca. <sighs> this is a really sad part of the tour, man. Ending. How do we do, Phil? We do okay? We did pretty well. I think we did pretty good. That was a good one. A lot of information. But now we're next to City Hall. I covered this one in a different video, or I can cover it in a different one. But we're done with the tour, guys. I don't know what to tell you. This is a very sad moment for me. It always is. I'm trying to keep it together. But uh, if you can, please subscribe. That helps me a lot. I'm trying to grow this channel. Please follow me on Instagram. All that stuff helps me a lot. If you're ever in New York, hit me up. I'll show you around. I'll be happy to. So just follow me on Instagram or go through my website. Check this out. See that behind me? Kind of crazy. It's kind of cool we just caught that. It's a protest. Yeah. Delivery, pro delivery guy protest here in New York. Pretty cool. Welcome to New York, baby. It's not dead, that's for sure. Not yet, at least. That's a long protest, but while it's passing behind me, guys, please help out. Please um, subscribe, do all that stuff. And uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. We did it. It's done. <sighs> See y'all later. Sick.